Hi, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, and welcome to the laboratory walkthrough for the Motion A vacuum and evaporator experiment. I'm Mark Roberts, and a co-instructor for Chemical Engineering 3070 at Clemson University. Go Tigers! Okay, so the objective of this video is to go through the, or to outline my expectations for your preliminary report for this experiment, and go through some of the experimental apparatus that will be used um, in this experiment. So the preliminary report consists of four parts. It includes a literature, re a literature review, uh, sample calculations, objectives, general methods and data tables, and a procedure. So let's start with the general expectations for the literature review. Okay, this is not to be confused with a book report. I'm not interested in reading a book report. Also, I don't want to read about how to calibrate or how to how or why we calibrate a rotometer because that's really not that useful for this particular experiment. If you spend all your time on rotometers, I'm going to get really mad, but I'm going to continue grading the report in painstaking detail. For the literature review, you should focus on things that are important to help you with the experiment. Some of those things might be, you know, what is the expected value of the heat transfer coefficient for this type of system? You know, you can also look at what are your expected values for the delta T that you should be able to achieve based on your maximum steam pressure or based on your vacuum pressure within, the, within this vacuum evaporator. Right? Those things can actually be used to predict what your evaporation rate is. So you can, you can estimate some of these things ahead of time, use these parameters to you know, select target values or operating conditions to use in this experiment. Okay, for the objectives, general methods, and data tables, what you should do is really restate your, general, your objectives for this experiment. Those will be things like determine the heat transfer coefficient for this experiment or for the system, um, some sort of design scenario of either some, a, a scale up or a, a particular job that needs to be processed, your objectives are not going to be things like calibrating the rotometer or using bucketing scale to measure mass or the mass flow rate, even though those are tasks associated with the experiments. Um, again, your data table should have all should have entries for all of the measurements that are uh, discussed in the procedure, all the things that are going to be measured that are going to be used in your sample calculations. You should have data tables that can accept those uh, measurements for each particular run. Your general methods can, can generally focus on, you know, what are the overall things you're doing in this experiment? You know, you might, you might uh, turn on the evaporator, pull, pull a vacuum, establish steady state, measure flow rates, use those to calculate heat transfer coefficients, etc. So general methods don't have to include the intricate details, but generally you're going to tell the reader what you're doing in order to achieve uh, your objectives that were discussed previously. Okay, your sample calculations. Um, these are going to be all the calculations that are necessary to take your experimental measurements and use those to calculate your objectives, like heat transfer coefficient or your design criteria, which might be either time required to process a, a certain amount of material or a reactor scale up needed to do a job within a specific period of time. I spend most of the time talking about your procedure here as we go through various aspects of this experiment, but generally for your procedure, you want to think about you know, telling the user in, um, in precise detail what specifically they need to do in order to make the measurements that are necessary. And your target audience for this can be a sophomore level chemical engineering student, someone who's say past 2110 or um, 2200, uh, but then you should be thinking about any chemical engineering student who you're talking to in these classes should be able to follow uh, the instructions that you are providing. Okay, so now let's go through the experimental apparatus. And we're going to do this in a few parts. I'm going to talk in general about the evaporator and the condenser. I'm going to talk about how to turn on the steam, how to apply heating to the system, um, how we make measurements of the overhead condensate flow rate, uh, and how we, how we pull vacuum on the system using a steam jet ejector. So we're going to break this up into a few different parts. But first, let's talk about safety. The biggest safety hazards associated with this experiment are you know, burning yourself, on the, on the hot tubes or hot valves, or slips, trips, and falls. Okay, so be, be mindful about these things and make note about the potential hazards that might come into play uh, for this particular experiment. Okay, so let's first start with the rotometers. So the rotometers are behind me. We don't need to talk about these in detail, but these are gonna supply water to the evaporator system. Okay, so there's a main water supply line to the system, which is, which is shown up here, and then this feeds into the rotometers where there's a supply valve over here. There's a, there's a valve for each rotometer. Now, 
now you only really need one rotameter um, to feed the experiment when you get the steady state condition based on the rate of evaporation achievable with this system. But there are two available in case you want to fill up the evaporator a little bit quicker. Um, again, these aren't something you need to focus on, but if your assignment asks you to calibrate them or verify a calibration, um, provide a brief procedure in order to do that. Okay, so here's the vacuum evaporator pan for the system. So heating occurs in this pan down at the bottom, but the contents of the evaporator can fill up and really you know, fill up the system. But you, your, your, your fill line shouldn't be greater than 12 and a half on this fill indicator, or else the, the contents of the evaporator will start spilling over into your vacuum system. So you really want to avoid that. Okay, so again, the water the water is going to enter the evaporator through this system right here, through this valve. We can fill up the evaporator and measure the level as shown by the level indicator here. Currently, if you can see from the video, the level in the evaporator is around five and a half. Um, okay, so the the when steam is applied to the evaporator, the evaporator material is going to flow up into the condenser over here. Okay, so in the condenser, there's going to be cooling water flowing, which is going to condense the vapor. And the overhead condensate is going to come out um, in this location down here. Also, what's possible is if, if your assignment requires, you can you can pull up some of the concentrate, you can pull off some of the concentrated product from the bottoms of the evaporator. At the bottom of the evaporator is a valve that can be opened to empty out the evaporator if necessary, or to draw it out at a particular rate. So before we apply any type of heating to the system, we're going to want to fill up the evaporator to a target level. Uh, using the rotameters as discussed previously. And then we'll want to supply cooling water to the, uh, to the condenser. So the cooling water can be applied to the overhead condenser by opening this valve, and then there's another valve at the exit of the condenser. Right? So the flow rate of the water uh, to the condenser should be controlled by the flow rate exiting the condenser um, and then with, this valve, with this valve wide open. Once you apply your heating and get your system to steady state, the main consideration you want to think about in terms of your condenser is you want to maintain at least a 10 degree difference in the entering versus exiting temperature on the condenser. So in order to get the values for the temperature, those can be determined from the thermocouples shown over here. Thermocouple number two tells you the condenser coolant output, so the output of this condenser. And then TC number three is going to tell you the coolant supply. So what is this going to give you the temperature of the supply of water to all components of the system? Okay, when you have water in the evaporator, you have uh, cooling water flowing to the condenser, uh, you can then supply steam to your evaporator, to the pan part of the evaporator. So the steam, can, the steam line has a main supply line that might be out of the video frame up above. And then it has a supply line to the steam jet ejector, and then another supply line that's going to feed the evaporator, and also a pneumatic controller. Okay, so the supply line to the evaporator, the main supply and the supply to the evaporator need to be open. Um, it's advisable to put a rag or something over this valve because this valve will get very hot for this experiment. All right, now to control this control, to, to control the pneumatic valve, we're going to need to establish uh, air pressure. Okay, so the air pressure can be established first by opening the main supply to the air pressure, and then by using the steam controller. So I highly recommend that you refer to the uh, controller procedures that were provided um, with this course and written by Mr. Coburn to, to give you know, clear instructions about how to um, how to turn on the air and how to operate these controllers. But briefly, we'll discuss that. Okay, so the steam controller can be opened, as shown here. All right, so once the air supply is entirely turned on, then the regular air needs to be opened by turning it to the right. Okay? By turning this valve to the right, we'll focus on the, the supply pressure of the steam controller. So you want to turn the regulator to the right until the supply pressure reaches 20 PSIG. Once this reaches 20 PSIG, you want to leave it there for the remainder of the experiment. Okay, so that establishes the airflow to the controller. Once there's, once there's air pressure on the controller, we can now control the set point of the steam. We can control the pressure set point of the steam that's being fed to the evaporator pan. Okay, so the pressure of the steam fed to the evaporator is going to be indicated by this gauge. Um, in, in, in terms of PSIG. So the maximum pressure you can expect to achieve for this experiment is about 110 to 120 PSIG. And that set point can be changed by turning this knob um, clockwise to increase the set point of the pressure. Note that you don't want to change this or you shouldn't change
change just more than about a quarter of a turn. This experiment will require measurements of temperatures, pressures, and mass flow rates. So various temperatures can be measured by thermal couples, which will be displayed on this system or displayed on this output up here. Uh, the various temperatures will be measured uh, by pressure gauges that are shown. Uh, and mass flow rates can be determined typically using bucket and scale. So the mass flow rates of the, of the condenser cooling water can be measured behind me. So behind me there's uh, the outlet of the overhead cooling water. That tube can be um, delivered into a, a bucket and the mass of the bucket can be measured or the change in the mass over various time can be measured. Uh, same with the steam condensate that's coming out of the pan on the evaporator to measure the flow of steam through the pan on the evaporator. Measurement of the overhead condensate flow rate is a little bit harder because the container to collect the overhead condensate is going to be under vacuum. So to make a measurement of the mass that's been the, the, the mass of the overhead vapor that's been produced over a given period of time requires us to break the vacuum. So to break the vacuum, we're going to need to close the valve um, where the vapor is coming out, but we also have to close another valve that's at the top of the experiment uh, that, that makes sure that this container stays under vacuum. Okay, once we close those two valves, we can then vent this container, remove the glass container from the steel cage, and make a measurement of its mass. It's important to make sure you're wearing rubber gloves when you're handling this glass container so you don't drop it. This is quite expensive. Um, we don't want to deal with that. Alright, so the tricky thing here is you need to really consider the time for which you're collecting the overhead vapor. As soon as this valve is closed, once you've got your system to steady state, overhead vapor is going to start to accumulate. Right? So this needs to be accounted for when you're determining the mass of the overhead vapor that's being generated within a given period of time. Now you don't have to be you don't have to be super fast when, you're, when you when you know, make a measurement of this container. You want to make sure that the overhead condensate doesn't necessarily fill up this container too high, or else that can get into the steam jet ejector or in places where it's not supposed to. Be. In order to establish a vacuum inside the evaporator, we use a steam jet ejector. Now, according to some of my colleagues, this is the part of the experiment that you're going to mess up, right? So I want to give you every opportunity to make sure you get this to work correctly and you get this to work safely. Okay, so the steam jet ejector is shown here. We have, we have high pressure steam that comes down, that comes by uh, the tube that's connected to your evaporator into a heat exchanger, and then the steam condenses flows out into the drain. Okay, so the, the, the steam injector involves high pressure steam and it also involves cooling water. Okay, so when this steam, when this steam jet ejector is running, um, we'll have the cooling water turned on and you'll also have high pressure steam flowing through the system. Okay, so there's a couple, again, you have to turn, you need to think about how should you turn this on in a way that's, that's, that's really safe, right? So you need to establish the steam and the cooling water. I think it's fairly obvious how you might do that or how you might get that going. But again, you'll have to make sure you clearly describe this in your procedure and wait and see. Okay, the steam jet ejector, it works, it works like an aspirator works. So in your general chemistry or organic chemistry, you might have used an aspirator where you connect something to a faucet, the flow of liquid created a vacuum so that you can do vacuum filtration or some other vacuum type of measurement. Steam jet ejector works the same way. There's high pressure steam that's gonna flow through the steam jet ejector. Um, any vapor, the vapor that it's in contact with, the, that is again connected to the evaporator, is going to get sucked into that high pressure steam, and it's going to exit with the steam condensate. Right? So the steam jet ejector essentially pulling vacuum on your evaporator experiment. Okay, so to, to, to get this turned on, we will already have the main supply, the steam supply line open from the previous part of the experiment. And then there's another valve shown here to supply steam to the steam jet ejector. But it's also going to be important to open the valve coming out of the steam jet ejector so you can actually empty out the steam condensate. If you don't empty the steam condensate, you're not going to be able to establish a vacuum because it's just going to fill the heat exchanger. Uh, the temperature of the cooling water, again, it's going to flow through. There's a, a supply line for the cooling water on the steam jet ejector. And there is a valve to the outlet of the, of the steam jet ejector. Okay, so you can really, you can. The important thing to consider for the cooling water is make sure that the outlet steam or outlet temperature of the cooling water is less than 110 degrees Fahrenheit because that's where you can start to get burned. Okay, so you don't have to use the maximum flow, you don't have to waste a lot of water. But just make sure the temperature coming out is below about 110 Fahrenheit. Once you have the steam jet ejector engaged, you can 
can now set the vacuum pressure of the evaporator. So the vacuum inside the evaporator is going to be indicated by this vacuum gauge. Um, you can go from zero to maybe 25 PSIG vacuum if, if, if you're lucky. Okay, so there's a couple ways we can actually set this vacuum pressure inside the evaporator. One way is to, is to change the amount of steam that's flowing into the steam jet ejector. Um, less steam is going to create less of a vacuum. There's also a coarse valve shown behind here, and that will actually bleed some air into the system. And then there's a finer adjustment of the vacuum pressure um, based on this vacuum control. So inside here, we can change the we can change the vacuum pressure by adjusting this knob shown here. You might not be able to see it on the video, but there's a knob in here, and it says increase the vacuum by turning this knob counterclockwise. On this indicator, there's, there's a hard stop. There's a line shown here, so you don't want to go past this line in terms of getting to a higher pressure. It's not going to help you any more um, than getting to the line. So you, it's really your choice on how you want to change the vacuum. You know, you want to think about how to get the highest or the maximum vacuum in the system, which will depress your boiling point and give you the, the highest maximum delta T obtainable for this experiment. Okay, so that about sums up what you need to know for the Mojine vacuum pan evaporator experiments. Um, soon we'll have a, an in-person walkthrough where you'll have some, you know, where you'll have an opportunity to ask me questions about the system, and I also have an opportunity to ask you about your preparedness for the experiment. So, for example, I might ask you questions like, you know, where, what is the delta T that's required in calculating the overall heat transfer coefficient you for this experiment? Those would be some of the things that I might expect you to know. You know, coming into this walkthrough as you prepare for this experiment. Some of the questions you might ask me are, how do I turn on the steam jet ejector again? And again, I might refer you back to this video, or how do I do bucketing scale? I mean, come on, these are things that you know. Um, some better questions you might ask me are, should I expect to see a maximum in the, in the heat transfer coefficient with delta T? All right, that's a good question. I might know, I might not know. But again, I probably won't tell you because that's one of the things that you can determine by doing this particular experiment. All right, so you're going to want to do a couple different measurements with a couple different conditions, and you'll need to replicate some of those, or you'll need to replicate your best system a couple times. But again, these are things that you should think about and decide ahead of time. All right, so good luck preparing. I look forward to talking with you and working with you on this experiment.